2022 is going to be over before we know it, which means it's time to get your 2023 calendars ordered. What would you say if I told you that you could get a calendar with some of your favorite independent true crime podcasts, including Eel Crime? Pre-order your copy at podcastcalendars.com and get $5 off your order by using our promo code OLDCRIMERS. That's O-L-D-E-C-R-I-M-E-R-S. And if you order before November 30th, you can get an additional 10% off. That's podcastcalendars.com, code OLDCRIMERS. Don't miss your chance to spend May with us, and we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, <laughs> strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. I would say, how are you and how's it going? But I saw you last night, so I have a better idea than most weeks. <laughs> this is true. You did. You ready for this? I am. So this is the first one that's not Spooktober. Yep. We have passed Spooktober. You should have, by now, if you were listening in order, heard our Halloween special, mm-hmm. which I'm sorry for my horrible <laughs> Nicolas Cage impersonation. I'm not. I had the best time with that episode. <laughs> It was a really fun episode to edit. Yeah, I don't remember much of it. I just know that I had a great time recording it. And so I'm really excited for people Mm -hmm. to hear it because that's us at our like peak slap happy sisterly Mm -hmm. hangout time. So like Mm -hmm. that's a couple glasses of wine and some cheese and crackers type level. But we were stone cold sober the whole time. We were stone cold sober. So (laughs) You're welcome. But yeah, you can imagine that we were not stone cold sober. And that's how yeah. we would be if we were not yeah. sober. Eating cheese and gasping about ghosts. <laughs> so we're traveling this Ooh, week. Where? Yeah, I'll find out. We are going to be discussing Edward Ned Kelly. Okay, the last name has some ind- indications. Yeah, we're going to Europe. At the very least, if not. We're going to start there. Is it on an island, perchance? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know where we're going. All right. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2011 WSJ article by Enda Curran. Curran? I'm going to go with Curran. All right. A 1974 Australian Dictionary of Biography, Volume 5. Listing by John V. Barry, 1953 The Mirror Article, 1880 Leader Article, 1880 The Age Article, 1880 The Argus Article, Genie.com, my favorite, Iron Outlaw, The National Museum of Australia, State Library of Victoria, and Victoria Collections. I didn't include Wikipedia this week because I literally did not even touch it. Dang. I had that much source material that I was like, I don't need you. Wow. But that felt made you feel powerful. <laughs> I only used it to help me look for source material. And then I was like, bye, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing a lot of my work for me. <laughs> so sorry, Wikipedia. Honorable mention, Wikipedia. Honorable mention. Yeah. Inspired by... <laughs> and links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. So this takes place in New Zealand. I got it. 
you're there. You're okay. in you're in the spot. I'm in the spot. The Philippines. Let's pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Kellys of the Philippines. <laughs> the famous Kellys of the Philippines. <laughs> famous, famous Philippines Kellys. <laughs> Edward Ned Kelly was born in either December 1854 or June 1855 oh. in Beveridge, Victoria, Australia, to parents John Red Kelly and Ellen Quinn. Red Kelly? It's a very yeah. cool middle name. Well, that was his nickname. Oh. Red, quote unquote. All right. All right. He has a little bit of a darker undertone now. Yeah, he's got, he's got a, <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit dangerous sounding. Red. It makes me think of that 70s show. It does. It does. She was dangerous too. She was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kitty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I loved her. Anyway, Ned's father, John, was it John? Yes. Ned's, fa <laughs> Ned's father, John, there are so many names in this. Oh, my God. Was born in Tipperary, Ireland in 1820. And in 1841, at the age of 21, he was sentenced to seven years in a penal colony in Australia for stealing two pigs. They must have been really big pigs. And they must have just really hate hated John. <laughs> I'm imagining they were like Charlotte's Web type level pigs they were some right. pig <laughs> right maybe he was saving them from eating he was saving two babies from their faces getting eaten and then he just maybe. got thrown into a penal colony for not letting those pigs the french were like no we need those pigs can't have it can't do it <laughs> it's god's will you gotta let those <laughs> pigs eat those babies faces <laughs> To, the, to Australia you go. <laughs> yep. After arriving at Van Diemen's Land in 1842, or Tasmania. Okay. I, I never knew that name of Tasmania before. I hadn't either. I had to Google it. I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> like, it's Tasmania. Hmm. Okay. All right. I kind of like that it was called Van Diemen's Land. Sounds yeah. really badass. Tasmania is just as badass. Yep. John moved to the Port Phillip District in 1848 after serving out his sentence. Mm -hmm. And it was there on November 18th, 1850, that he married 18-year-old Ellen when he was 30 at St. Francis's Roman Catholic Church in Melbourne. Nice. Went down to Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Fancy. They would go on to have five daughters and three sons together, the eldest of which was Ned Kelly. Nice. They all sounded like maybe they lived through childbirth and stuff? One of them didn't. Still. So I'll, 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 get, I'll get there. But that's really, that's a lot of kids. Eight kids? Dang. Five mm -hmm. daughters, three sons? Wow. Yeah. Ned's and his siblings included Mary, who was born in 1851, I think she's the one that didn't make it. I think she's the okay. one that she lived a month and then she passed away. Okay. Annie, who was born in 1853. Ned, born in 1854, 55, around there. Maggie, who was born in 1857. Jim, who was born in 1859. Dan, who was born in 1861. Kate, who was born in 1863. And Grace, who was born in 1865. I'm sorry, as an aside, all of those names would be really fantastic to listen to in an Australian accent. So good good job on the names. <laughs> Dan. Oh, <yeah. laughs> right? Dan. Like when you, I could, I could hear them. I could hear them all in my head. Can't repeat them, but excellent yep. choice. So Ellen Quinn, the, the mother, mm -hmm. along with her six brothers and sisters, had arrived in Australia in 1841, having emigrated from County Antrim, Ireland. Hmm. Her father, James Quinn, rented land in Brunswick for dairying, you know, milk and cows, yes. and he hired John Red Kelly to help work it, which is how the two met. Ooh, scandalous. So he hired him 
after he had done his stint in prison. I bet that was probably one of the few jobs he could get after that. Yeah, it sounded like in like all my research that a lot of places, if you had been served jail time, a lot of places didn't want to have anything to do with you. Mm-hmm. Doubly so if you were Irish. Yeah. So I think it's an Irishman helping another Irishman out. And it was yep. ballsy, too, because he was in prison for stealing livestock. And he let him yeah. work on his dairy farm. Like, that's that would have been a risk. But when he was stealing the livestock, that was during the famine, the Great yeah. Famine. Yeah. So, not that I'm saying thievery is okay, but... People do what they feel they need to do in times of need like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Saving babies' faces. <laughs> Doing God's work. The pair lived at the Quinn home until they were able to get their own place in Beverage in 1854 for 70 pounds, or around 6,000 pounds today. Damn. Cheap. The family moved to a plot of land that was 21 acres, and in January of 1859, John built the family a two-room timber cottage, and Ned was about four at that time. Okay. In 1862... Ned started attending the Roman Catholic school in town, along with his sister Annie, who was nine, and Maggie, who was six. Within six months, he had learned to read and write before the family moved just two years later in 1864, after his father sold their farm for 80 pounds, or around 7,900 pounds today. Okay. So making some profit. Yeah, a little bit. But the the house was the big selling point. Probably, although it wasn't. I mean, it was a two-room house. It wasn't. Still, better than nothing. A McMansion. But (laughs) it looked nice. I saw pictures of it. It looked nice. In 1865, Ned saved a seven-year-old boy named Richard Shelton from drowning in Hughes Creek at Avenel. Ned, who was 10 at the time, dove into the water to pull him out before taking him to his parents' hotel. The family was so grateful that they awarded him a green silk sash as recognition for his bravery and his Irish heritage. That's really cute. Right? That's so cute. It also had gold in it. Thanks for saving our son. Here's his sash. Like, they just had a sash? I I don't know. That's crazy. I mean, they owned a hotel. I'm sure they had fancy things. Yeah, but... And... It's speculated that they also paid his father's court fine so he could be released from prison early. Aw, that's really nice. Because at the time, his dad was in prison. Oh, I wonder what he did. Ned was able to attend school until his father passed away on December 27, 1866, when Ned was 12 years old. Ned's father had recently been released from a six-month stint in jail, where he was ordered to perform hard labor. Uh Uh-oh. And it appears as if it contributed to his ill health, Mm -hmm. leading him to pass in his mid-40s from dropsy. Now, we've discussed dropsy in the past, which is an alcohol-induced illness that bloats the body, Mm -hmm. which makes sense if you consider the fact that John took up drinking heavily after his release. Yeah, I mean... That was a really hard life, and I bet he had a lot of really horrible memories of PTSD that he was trying to suppress. And if you're in a lot of pain from doing hard labor for six mm-hmm. months, that's a good way to make the pain stop. Kind of makes everything stop. Literally. Not that I'm advocating for alcoholism, but no, you know what I mean? But it's... you can see why he chose that path. Yeah. Potentially. Left destitute... Ellen and her seven children had to move into a hut at 11 Mile Creek in northeastern Victoria. Until he left home, Ned had become the family breadwinner because he was the oldest son. He took on a number of small jobs to earn a few shillings, such as breaking in horses, mustering cattle, which is kind of where you gather the cows. Mm Kind of like sheep herding. Yeah. Ring barking which is where you strip 
an entire section of bark all the way around a tree to kill it. So it makes it easier to cut it down. Okay. And also fencing. So repairing fences. And Mm -hmm. cattle duffing. Which is when you steal cows. (laughs) Just like his dad. Full circle. Only cows, not pigs. Ned's storied life of crime began at the age of 14 in 1869 when he was arrested for assaulting a Chinese man and was held for 10 days in the Benalia jail before the charges were dismissed by Magistrate Alfred Wyatt. Uh, Great. It's not like he was experiencing racism. So let's just spread it and continue to be racist too. Great. Okay. Okay. I can't remember because there was a lot going on when I was in researching this. Yeah. I think in relation to this assault of a Chinese man, it was a matter of, I think it involved horses. Like the man had accused him of stealing a horse and he was like, yeah, no, I didn't do that. And mm. some sort of scuffle happened. He's like, shut up. Yeah. I think that's kind of how it started. Okay. So it was all bad, is what you're saying. <laughs> it, it was all bad, yeah. <laughs> okay. The next year, in 1870, he was once again arrested and held in custody for almost two months for being a suspected accomplice to Bush Ranger Harry Power, who taught him all he knew. He was once again released due to lack of evidence. Okay. So a Bush Ranger is basically someone who lives outside of civilization. Think of an outlaw living in the wild bush of Australia. Okay. They commonly, during the 18th and 19th centuries, preyed upon miners, who were primarily Chinese, Mm -hmm. settlers, and the aborigines of the less populous areas of Australia. Okay. So great. (laughs) Preying on um, the right kind of people. Damn. I will give you a spoiler in that this story, none of that happens. Okay. So he was taught how to do it, but he never actually did it himself. He never actually went after those types of people. Okay. He didn't prey on anybody that was worse off than him. Okay. Okay. So it's not that kind of story. Okay, thanks, Ned. Thanks, Thanks, Ned. (laughs) At the age of 15, again in 1870, Ned was convicted for a number of offenses and spent six months in jail for assault. Great. Again, likely for a horse, because not long Mm -hmm. after his release, he was arrested again, this time for accepting a stolen horse. Oh, okay. So he didn't steal it, but... The other person did, and because he was like, yeah, I'll take that stolen horse, he got arrested. Yep. Awesome. (laughs) But I didn't steal it. (laughs) He spent three years in prison for it and was ordered to perform hard labor. Awesome. They really liked hard labor down there, huh? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Was that kind of the majority of it? At this time, yes. A lot of it was hard labor. Dang. Because they're... Having them basically build their own prisons. So mm-hmm. he was released from prison in 1874 at the age of 18. And in this year, his mother got remarried to a man named George King. She had four more children with him. Dang. Ellen, who was born in 1873. Jack, who was born in 1875. And Alice, who I have literally zero information on other than her name. Interesting. Okay. There's no birth or death date for her that I could find anywhere. She just is. (laughs) She just is and was. (laughs) And forever will be. (laughs) Alice. (laughs) At this time, Ned was described as, quote, physically most imposing, handsome with a full beard, but strangely piercing eyes, end quote. Ooh. Makes him sound... Like an exotic bad boy from prison. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He actually, if you look at pictures of him, actually was pretty handsome. Uh, He, yeah. He had 
like the Steve Harrington like hair thing going on. Really? <laughs> and like a nicely kept beard. I I would dig it. I'd dig nice. it. Nice. For the next two years, Ned seemed to have gotten his life around and spent that time working as a timber getter or a logger. Mm-hmm. But in 1876, he joined his stepfather, George, in stealing horses. Yeah, he was probably told to do it, honestly. Mm-hmm. If his mom asked, he probably wouldn't be able to say no. Yeah. At the time, Ned's family started to view themselves as victims of police persecution, since they were privy to a lot of the horse and cattle thefts that were taking place where they lived. It was their family and a couple other families that were also kind of like pretty close knit because they were all mm-hmm. originally from Ireland. Okay. And because of racism mm-hmm. or whatever you want to call it, racism. Yeah, because Australia was still very much a British colony. Yes. So because of that and because of the area in which they lived and the fact that a few of the Kellys had turned to crime, it was inferred that all of them were criminals. So the police tended to be like, well, you guys are all just criminals. So Yeah, you're all bad, so one of you must have done it. Yeah, so one of you must have done something because you're all bad. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1877, Ned was arrested for, quote, riding across a footpath and drunkenness, end quote, which was odd because Ned didn't drink. Okay. That sounds like a roofy situation. That's kind of what he said when he was later asked about it. He's like, I don't drink. So he maintains that he was drugged, Mm. which, I mean, there's really no way of proving that, but. Especially then. Ned's younger brother, James, was arrested at the age of 15 in 1873 for cattle rustling and spent five years in jail for it. Jeez. Following his release, James moved to Wagga Wagga in 1877, where he was again sentenced for stealing horses. And this time he spent 10 years in prison. God. Okay. So at this point, he's now, what, 30? And he spent half his life in prison. Yep. After he was released in 1887, James turned his life around and spent the rest of his life crime-free until his death at the age of 88 in 1946. Okay. I'm just letting you know that. He's not dead yet, obviously. But Yeah, but that's just like, our stories don't end happily, so what what happened? (laughs) Well, that's the middle brother. Okay. Ned's other brother, Dan, was arrested and sentenced to three months in prison in 1877 at the age of 16 for property damage. That doesn't seem like as intensive a sentence. I wonder what the property damage was. I can't remember. That's okay. I just picture him, like, knocking down a ceramic something. And then they're like, three months! And he's like, what? (laughs) Yeah, I think it was something stupid, if I'm remembering right. It was just something really dumb. In April of 1878, police trooper Alexander Fitzpatrick went to the Kelly home to arrest Dan for stealing horses. When he arrived at the home, Ned allegedly shot him twice, according to Fitzpatrick. Ned denied that he was even at his mother's house that night. But during a trial, three other police officers testified that he had confessed to committing the crime. Cute. At the time, the only people in attendance at the house were Ellen, so the mother, Mm -hmm. Dan, the youngest brother, Mm -hmm. the sisters Maggie and Kate, Maggie's husband, Will Killian, and their neighbor, William Williamson. What a name. (laughs) Billy Bill. (laughs) Billy Bill. Bill Billyson. Bill Billyson. Fitzpatrick had apparently grabbed a drink at the tavern before going to execute the arrest warrant. While at the Kelly home, he made a pass at Kate, who was 14 at the time, and Dan started a scuffle with the officer as a result. Yeah, I bet. Makes sense. Uh Uh-huh. During the fight... Fitzpatrick's gun went off and nicked his wrist, so he shot himself in the wrist. 
and was embarrassed because he was trying to be a pedophile. Shot himself in the head. After Ellen patched him up, she invited him to stay for dinner to, quote, let bygones be bygones. End quote. Yeah, like, please leave my family alone. Yep. And we won't tell anybody. And on his way back to the station, he stopped at the tavern again to get some whiskey. Why not? He then reported to his superiors that Dan had resisted arrest and shot him in the wrist and that Ned, who wasn't even there, had offered to remove the bullet with a rusty razor blade. Cute. Wow. This would go on to be known as the Fitzpatrick Incident. Great. It has its own name. Later, Ned would note this event in his manifesto, which I'll get it to in the future. Oh, great. It's a manifesto. That's... <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <sighs> Stating, quote, The trooper pulled out his revolver and said he would blow her... Ellen's brains out if she interfered in the arrest. She told him it was a good job for him. Ned was not there, or he would ram the revolver down his throat. End quote. So he probably wouldn't have even known that Ned existed in his current state had his mom not said anything. Following the run-in with Fitzpatrick, Dan went on the run and into hiding, and soon his mother stepbrother William Skillian and neighbor William Williamson were all arrested for aiding and abetting the attempted murder of Trooper Fitzpatrick. Oh, it's a murder now when he was shot in the wrist. Yes, they tried to kill him. Mm. Yep. Both Ned and Dan offered to surrender in order to have their mother released, but their offer was refused. Cute. So in October of 1878, all three were tried at Beechworth and convicted. Judge Sir Redmond Barry sentenced Ellen to three years hard labor, and she had to go to jail with her baby Alice. Oh my god. And both of the men, so the stepson and the neighbor, mm -hmm. were sentenced to six years hard labor. Wow. Just because they were at the house. Yeah. You know, you know this stuff goes on, but it it never gets easier when you hear about it. It never gets easier. A 100 pound or 9,200 pounds today reward was offered for the arrest of Ned and his brother Dan, who hid in the wombat ranges near Mansfield. <laughs> nice. The wombats are keeping them safe. <laughs> you can hide in these wombat mountains. Gotta get through the marsupials to get through me, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get ya. Go get you. The brothers were soon joined by Joe Byrne, who was 21 and from Beechworth, and Steve Hart, who was 18 and from Wangaratta. Okay. The four then formed the Kelly Gang. Nice name. Ned and Joe were particularly close, with Joe essentially taking over as kind of his like right-hand man. Okay. That same month in October, all four of the men headed to Bullock Creek, where they hoped to earn money running a whiskey distillery and gold mine in order to try and appeal Ellen's sentence and get her and baby Alice out of jail. That's so sweet that, like, the other guys were trying to help, too. Mm-hmm. Because they knew it was fucked. Police set out to come up with a plan to capture the gang. Of course. They dispatched two parties, both headed for the Wombat Ranges, one from Greta in the north, and another contingent from Mansfield in the south. Sergeant Michael Kennedy and three constables, Thomas Lonigan, Michael Scanlon, and McIntyre, I could not find his first name, set out around this time in search of Ned and Dan from Mansfield in the south. None of them wore uniforms, but each of them were heavily armed. Great! So they were trying to kind of be sneaky like undercover cops yes mm -hmm. as an aside because that guy doesn't have a first name he's mac mackerson or like mac mackinson or something like that <laughs> mac mcintyre yeah that's his name okay mm -hmm. i like it <laughs> on october 25th 1878 the four lawmen were camping at stringybark creek unknown to them ned had seen them 
and reported back to the rest of the boys, believing that he and his brother were likely to be shot on sight. Yeah, they probably would have. On October 26th, Sergeant Kennedy and Constable Scanlon went on patrol, and while they were away, the Kelly gang attacked the camp. Ooh. Ned shot and killed Constable Lonigan after he drew his revolver, and Constable McIntyre surrendered. Ned would later note of this encounter, quote, I was compelled to shoot them, or lie down and let them shoot me. It would not be willful murder if they packed our remains in, shattered into a mass of gore to Ma Mansfield. They would have got great praise and credit as well as promotion, but I am reckoned a horrid brute because I had not been cowardly enough to lie down for them under such trying insults to my people. Certainly their wives and children are to be pitied, but they must remember those men came into the bush with the intention of scattering pieces of me and my brother all over the bush. End quote. I can't say that's not true. So, based on previous in incidents throughout his entire life, I can see why he thinks that and would mm -hmm. likely be right. When Sergeant Kennedy and Constable Scanlon returned to camp, both refused to surrender to the Kelly gang. So Ned shot and killed Constable Scanlon and mortally wounded Sergeant Kennedy, who he went on to shoot in the heart as an act of mercy. That's nice. That would have been a pretty quick death. Yeah. Of the four, only Constable McIntyre survived and was able to escape to Mansfield to report the murders. Great. Joe kept Constable Scanlon's ring after Ned shot him dead off his horse. Joe was also seen as the more glamorous of the four. <laughs> as he wore distinctive high-heeled boots, was fond of reading and writing, and was also classically handsome. I didn't... Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know why this is so funny. But all I can think of is, like, he's classically handsome, he likes nice things, he wears high-heeled boots, but because he likes reading and writing, he's gay. <laughs> That's all I can think of. <laughs> Like, that's, that's the part where they were like, oh, look at this guy. He reads and writes. Woo. Like, none of the other things matter to me. I don't know why. It's so, like... Mr. Fancy over here. Mr. Fancy over here. <laughs> Sorry, that's really awful. <laughs> no, I was kind of thinking the same thing when I first, like, read and wrote that. I was like, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Reading and writing. Yeah. <laughs> and your fancy boots. <laughs> and your fancy high heeled boots. You keep nice quills in those boots. A couple weeks later, on November 15th, the government issued a proclamation of outlawry and offered a 500 pound or 46,000 pounds today reward for the capture of any member of the Kelly gang, dead or alive. That's not good. So with the proclamation of outlawry, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but outlawry, the Victorian government essentially authorized anyone to shoot any of the foremen on site, and they wouldn't face any charges for it. So it's just a really aggressive citizen's arrest? Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. This really is wild. <laughs> yeah, we haven't even gotten to the good part yet. Like, <laughs> oh buckle God. up. Police forces consisting of 200 officers did their best to track down the group of men, but their methods weren't the best. And on December 9th, the Kelly gang captured a sheep station at Faithful's Creek, locking 22 people up in a storeroom. Okay. Joe kept watch over the captives while Ned and the other two members of his gang rode into nearby Euroa, where they stole 2,000 pounds, or around 184,000 pounds today, of notes and gold from the National Bank. Dang. Cutting the telegraph lines from Melbourne to Benalla as they escaped. That's that's some movie badassery right there. They were smart. Well, one of them reads and writes <laughs> as a hobby. So. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, this would be a He's great like, play. You know, <laughs> he actually wrote a play. I read this somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Let's act it out. <laughs> following the successful heist the three returned to the sheep station with the bank staff the bank manager 
the manager's wife and seven children, his mother-in-law, maid, and their nanny. The whole gang's here. Yeah. He's like, you know what? Come with me. We'll hang out. We'll have a great time. Look at his boots. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous. Look what at is his this boots. guy. He can't be. Look at this He's guy. not dangerous. Look at him. He's classically handsome. <laughs> He's so handsome. If you're having a panic attack, just look at his face. It's fine. <laughs> the gang treated their hostages with the utmost respect. No violence. And they even entertained them prior to leaving by showing off their trick writing skills. I want to be kidnapped by them so bad. Right? This does sound great. <laughs> An artillery man who was later stationed in Euroa following the robbery, spoke with the townspeople and reported, quote, the people in the bank told me that with the exception of the robbers taking the money, they never offered the slightest insult to anyone. I also visited the young husband station where Joe Byrne was sentry over 30 persons while the others were in the bank and was told everyone that the outlaws were undoubtedly police-made criminals, end quote. We don't know what that is. We don't know what that's like. No. That doesn't still exist mm -hmm. today. As a result of the bank robbery, the government of Victoria doubled the reward for their capture to 1,000 pounds or 92,000 pounds today. Do they have the money? LOL. I know they do, but it's just like, <laughs> they took your money. <laughs> <laughs> you can have whatever money's left over once you kill them. It wasn't long after this that Ned was made aware that a number of his supporters were being harassed by the police force, with some of the men ending up in jail without a fair trial for months on end. Yep. Wanting to help his friends and relatives, he and his men devised a plan to get enough cash to cover the lost earnings and expenses of his supporters. So nice. On Saturday, February 8th, 1879... The Kelly gang set their sights on the town of Jaildry, which is about 30 miles or 48 kilometers north of the Murray River. After locking up two policemen, they took over the police station and stayed there until Monday the 10th. They then put on some police uniforms before holding up the Bank of New South Wales, walking away with 2,141 pounds or 206,000 pounds today in notes and coins. Dang. Their next stop was the Royal Hotel next door, where they took 60 hostages. It was on this date that Ned Kelly handed over his infamous Geraldry letter of over 8,000 words to a bank teller named Edward Living, asking him to have it published. The letter contained Ned's explanation and justification for his actions, and copies have survived and been transcribed with the copies transcribed by John Hanlon, currently residing in the National Museum of Australia. And I'll share some portions of the letter later on. So why did it have to be transcribed? Because it's really hard to read. <laughs> okay. Well. And it had to be transcribed because it ended up being printed. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was originally written by Joe Byrne. You know, the guy that can read and write. Because <laughs> I was so big and he wrote it. <laughs> I just love writing so, he, so much. <laughs> so he oh, wrote man. down what Ned dictated to him. And then those letters were retranscribed by a man named John Hanlon. And those copies are the ones that are in the Museum of Australia. Oh, I don't God. think the originals, I don't know what happened to the originals. I just picture them like hanging out at the end of the night. Under the stars with a campfire, just writing down words, doing what he loves best. Mm -hmm. Ned just... Just sitting back, like, playing with his suspenders, yeah. talking, and Joe's just like, scribble, scribble, scribble. As a thank scribble, you, scribble, he's, scribble. he's cleaning Joe's boots for him while Joe's writing it down. Because they're there best friends. They're best buds. Making sure the heels look real nice. Look real nice. <laughs> Because you're so classically handsome. You're so classically handsome. And you you love to rewrite so much. You're writing this for me. I'm going to clean your boots, Joe. I'm going to clean your boots. <laughs> After this, the reward for capture of the Kelly gang doubled to 2,000 pounds a head. So 193,000 pounds today per person. 
Yeah, because they were embarrassed. Yeah. Clearly. They're being embarrassed, and this is like Britain's prison colony, essentially. Yep. And the government had native trackers brought in from Queensland to aid in the search. Under the direction of Chief Commissioner Frederick Charles Standish, a blacklist was drafted of known Kelly Gang associates and sympathizers, and all were barred from owning land in the northeastern section of Victoria, which caused much of the population to rebel against the police. That's so fucked. I wonder why. In 1880, one of Joe Byrne's friends, a man named Aaron Sherritt, told police about his whereabouts. And on Saturday, June 27, 1880, Joe, learning about the betrayal, shot Aaron in the doorway of his Beechworth home. Even though Aaron had been put under the guard of four police constables. Interesting. Who were hiding in Aaron's bedroom because they didn't want to have to get shot. Oh, God. Okay. They were like, oh, no. That guy we were supposed to be protecting, he got shot. I don't want to go out there, do you? Nope. I don't want to get shot. <laughs> let's let's just hang out. We protected him enough. <laughs> yeah. Our watch has ended. As you can imagine, Aaron died. And after this, Joe and Ned's brother Dan joined the rest of the Kelly gang in Glenrowan, where they captured the railway station and took over Mrs. Ann Jones's hotel, taking 60 people hostage. Okay, this story is familiar now, at this point. You'll probably, it I might come to you in, yeah. in just a little bit. Yeah, I remember this part. The group was made aware of a special train that was set to arrive from Melbourne on Monday, June 29th, so they forced two railway workers to tear up some of the rails so they could rob the train. This plan was thwarted thanks to a schoolmaster named Thomas Kernow, who Ned had allowed to leave the hotel with his wife, sister, and child in tow. Mm. Thomas immediately alerted the train crew to the plot after he was able to stop the train using a light covered with a red shawl, halting the robbery. Mm. I need to note in here because I thought it was, like, so mean. They noted that Thomas, who was a school teacher, was like a cripple, and they were saying that he like hobbled as fast as he could to get to this spot to stop the train. And I was like, that's just mean. Why would you say that? That's so mean. Especially if like he's trying to help the crown and would be a hero otherwise. Yeah, like that's just like, according cool. to the government, he's a hero and shouldn't be. This, like, embarrassing schoolhouse cripple. Like, screw you guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously. I was like, <laughs> that's so mean. No redeeming qualities at this point. I mean, there haven't been for a while, but it continues to get worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. After the train stopped, the armed police and native troopers that had been on board disembarked and proceeded to the hotel. Meanwhile, the members of the Kelly gang had constructed themselves crude armor from plow mold boards, which are the metal plows with uh -huh. the circular plates that till the soil. Incredible. Ned had fashioned a special helmet for himself. I want you to picture the Black Knight from Monty Python, the cylinder <laughs> helmet. That's what he made. <laughs> Incredible. In addition to breast and back plates, and he also wore an apron that weighed around 90 pounds, or 41 kilograms. Dang. So, like, he wasn't standing up. He was. He was standing up. Dang. So he had, like, this, this heavy apron, this metal breast and back plate. He also had, like, like shoulder, shoulder pads type things. And, like, this big cylindrical helmet. And fun fact, do you remember that beautiful green sash that he received oh my God. when he was 10 years old? Yes. He wore it as a cummerbund under his armor, and it That's... still survives and is currently on display at the Costume and Pioneer Museum in Bunala. I love that so much. 
I think his inner child was fully healed when he put that comfort blend on. He was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. We did it. <laughs> Sash, don't fail me now. Yeah. Operating on little sleep. It had been two nights since they last rested. Yeah. And copious amounts of alcohol on the parts of everyone that was not Ned. Because as we know, Ned did not drink. Not yeah. to mention feeling a bit invincible thanks to their armor. <laughs> even though it severely impaired their range of motion. <laughs> the men prepared for a standoff with police. I know. It's just a bunch of dumb boys. Just being dumb. Like I know so many I know so many people who if they were in that situation would be like, We can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hyping themselves up. Yeah. I'm just picturing like, you know, like trash can lids for like the just, breastplate, you know, like the metal trash can lids. Yeah. Harnessing the energy of the wombats. Yes. Wombats. Hear our call. <laughs> wombats of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your power. Wombats of these ranges. <laughs> Pull us into your protective pouches. <laughs> <laughs> journalist tom carrington who witnessed the action in glen rowan described ned kelly as follows quote there was no head visible and in the dim light of morning with the steam rising from the ground it looked for all the world like a ghost of hamlet's father with no head only a very thick neck the figure continued gradually to advance, stopping every now and then, moving what looked like its headless neck mechanically round, and then raising one foot onto a log and aiming and firing a revolver. Shot after shot was fired at it, but without effect. End quote. <laughs> he can't see. He drops his leg <laughs> on a log and is like, right then, let's fucking do this. <laughs> what the fuck? Superintendent Hare, along with the police, headed to the hotel and opened fire at 3 a.m. The superintendent was shot in the arm, and Ned was shot in the foot, hand, and arm. The three other members of the Kelly gang returned to the hotel to regroup, while Ned would in went to hide in the bush and alerted the sympathetic townspeople that their goal of stopping the train had failed. I bet that was tough. Yeah, so remember how he had all those hostages in the hotel? Yeah. Most of the men that were in there were like, we're with you, Ned. And they were in the woods ready to help fight alongside the Kelly gang. That's so nice. The police continued to fire upon the gang in the hotel. And Joe was shot in the thigh while taking refuge in the hotel bar. He ended up bleeding out. Yeah, like you could hit a really good artery. John Sadlier wrote, noted Joe's final moments. Quote, we were told that Byrne had been firing and was in great spirits, boasting of what the gang was going to do. The work was hot and he went to the counter for a drink. Finding that the weight of the armor prevented him from throwing back his head to swallow the liquor, he lifted the apron-shaped plate with one hand, while with the other he lifted the glass to his mouth. In this attitude, a chance bullet struck him in the groin, and spinning around once, he fell dead. End quote. I actually, I, I've asked somebody once, like, being shot in the groin, is that really, like, that dangerous? And they're like, yeah. You get shot in the groin, you you bleed, you bleed out, you die. You don't think about it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's you fine. don't. And it's definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> Just getting shot in general is not great. <laughs> but especially in the groin. Yeah. Yeah, not not a good place. Meanwhile, the women and children of the town were also trapped inside the hotel, doing their best to avoid getting hit by police fire. Cute. I love that the police don't care. Ned returned to the hotel around 5 a.m., still covered in his armor, but was finally subdued after sustaining bullet wounds in both his legs. He'd been shot 28 times. 
And he was still just like walking to the hotel. Yeah. With probably well over like 120 pounds of extra weight. Yep. Damn. At this point, the bulk of the hotel captives had been able to escape, with the last two leaving the building around 10 a.m. Two of the captives were unfortunately caught in the police crossfire. An old man named Martin Cherry, who was hiding in the detached kitchen, was fatally wounded, again, by a police bullet to the groin. And the son of the hotel keeper, John Jones, was hit in the abdomen and died at the hospital. Again, really gotta love that the the purpose of protecting the people was just gone at that yep. point. Did not care. Yep. From the true story of Ned Kelly's last stand, quote, And then a wail of agony cut through the darkness. It was young Johnny Jones. A police bullet had smashed through the wall and into frail Johnny, just above his hip. Mortally wounded, he screamed for help. Oh, mother, I am shot. End quote. That's so sad. Mm -hmm. Ned was moved to the railway station, near death, when Father Matthew Gibney arrived off the most recent train. Upon the urging of Ned's sisters, Kate and Maggie, he gave Ned last rites before heading towards the hotel to look for the other members of the Kelly gang so he could do the same. With Ned in custody and Joe dead, Dan and Steve were the last two of the gang to be dealt with. The police continued their firefight at the hotel until around 3 p.m. when they just decided fuck it and set the whole building on fire. So they've been constantly shooting for 12 hours. Yes. And then they just burned it down. Yep. Yeah, really into the people. Yeah, really looking out for the locals there. Father Gibney entered the building prior to it fully going up in flames in order to perform last rites. And he also wasn't sure if there were other civilians that were in there. So he went in there to try and pull them out. He noted that three bodies were inside. That of Joe, who was pulled out by the police. So, you know, the one that died. And those of Dan and Steve who had both taken poison before being burnt almost to a crisp. The Kelly and Hart families came to claim the bodies of Dan and Steve, and both were interred at Greta Cemetery after their wake at 11 Mile Creek on Wednesday, July 1st. Ned Kelly was brought before Judge Sir Redmond Barry on October 28th and tried for the murder of Constable Thomas Lonigan at Stringy Bark Creek. After being found guilty, he was sentenced to death. Judge Barry famously concluded the sentence with, quote, and may the Lord have mercy on your soul, end quote. Cute. To this, Ned retorted, quote, I will see you there where I go, end quote. Hell yeah, Ned. Take him down. A massive effort was made to stay Ned's execution and see his sentence commuted to life in prison. Three days before his planned execution, a petition with more than 32,000 signatures was put before the governor. After an hour with the executive council, it was decided that the execution would continue as planned. Of course, they like really embarrassed them. There was mm -hmm. never going to be any plan. Like The entire country could have wrote signatures and it wouldn't have mattered. Mm-hmm. Edward Ned Kelly was hanged at the Mil Old Melbourne Jail at 10 a.m. on Thursday, November 11th, 1880, at the age of 25, before a crowd of 5,000 people. Damn. His last words were, quote, Ah, well, I suppose it has come to this, end quote. <laughs> Although a journalist later changed them to, quote, such is life, end quote. Not as cool. Not as cool. Don't wax poetic. Say what he said. And remember how Ned told the judge he'd see him after death? Mm -hmm. Well, 12 days after Ned was hanged, Judge Barry dropped dead in his chambers on November 23rd, 1880. Hell yeah, Ned. I'm going to become a demon just so I can take you with me. <laughs> I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you, brother. The following are excerpts from the November 12th, 1880 edition of the Argus regarding Ned's incarceration and execution. Quote, Immediately after sentence of death was passed on Kelly, additional precautions were taken to ensure his safe custody in the Melbourne jail. Mm -hmm. He was placed in one of the cells in the, the old wing, and irons were riveted upon his legs, 
leather pads being placed around his ankles to prevent chafing. When he could get anyone to speak to, he indulged in brag, recounting his exploits and boasting of what he could have done when at liberty had he pleased. He never, however, expressed any sorrow for his crimes. On the contrary, he always attempted to justify them, end quote. Yeah, why not mess with the people that have messed with him his entire life? Yep. You know what's going to happen. You might as well get a few more digs in. Yep. <laughs> Following his death, several death masks were made of Ned Kelly, with one still on display at the State Library of Victoria. His headless body was initially buried in an unmarked grave on jail grounds at Old Melbourne, but it was exhumed and moved to the Pentridge Prison Cemetery in the 1920s, before it was finally reinterred near his mother and extended family at Great Cemetery. Over the course of two years, it took the Victorian government, a large contingent of the police force, not to mention the exorbitant rewards, Mm -hmm. a total of 100,000 pounds, or 9.3 million pounds today, just to track down and put to justice four men. Justified according to them. It should be noted that during their crime spree, the Kelly gang were known for their good treatment of civilians and hostages. Mm -hmm. No one they ever captured was hurt by them. Mm -hmm. And if you'll remember, the two that were injured and later died had been shot by police, not by any of the gang members. And they took care of their families. Yep. They did all the robbing because they wanted to send that money to people that needed it. According to journalist and author Stanley Clive Perry Turnbull, quote, Ned Kelly is the best known Australian, our only <laughs> folk hero. Popular instinct has found in Kelly a type of manliness much to be esteemed. To reiterate, courage, resolution, independence, sympathy with the underdog. The legend brought into being the phrase as game as Ned Kelly for describing the ultimate in bravery inspired numberless imaginative tales and folk ballads, and has taken new life in Sidney Nolan's series of Kelly Gang paintings. But you're terrifying. The (laughs) legend still persists and seemingly has a compelling quality that appeals to something deeply rooted in the character of the average Australian, end quote. Ned's mother, Ellen Kelly King, passed away in 1923 at the age of 91. Yeah. It said that her last words to her son, Ned, before he was hanged, were, quote, mind you die like a Kelly son, end quote. Nice. As for Ned's siblings, Mary, the eldest, like I mentioned before, mm-hmm. only lived for a month. His sister Anne got married and had two daughters before passing away in 1872 at the age of 19. Oh. Right? His sister Maggie was married twice and had 14 children between the two before passing in 1896 at the age of 38. She had 14 children before she was 38? Yeah. Dang, she was a busy lady. (laughs) Busy lady. (laughs) This is very busy. (laughs) And I didn't didn't go down the rabbit hole on, like, how many made it, how many didn't. I was just like, that's a a lot of kids. Like, Congratulations. Let's get let's just keep moving. <laughs> yep. Damn. His brother James never married and passed away in 1946 at the age of 88. That's the one I mentioned at the very mm-hmm. beginning. His sister Kate got married and had seven children before passing away in 1898 at the age of 35 after she drowned. Oh, which is sad. Ned could have saved her. Yeah. And finally, his youngest sister, Grace, got married and had nine children before passing away in 1940 at the age of 74. I couldn't find a lot on his step-siblings, so that's why I didn't really go into them. Yeah. Well, and honestly, he might he probably didn't interact with them much because a lot of this went down like shortly after she, his mom remarried. Yeah, because he was eight... He was 18 when all this kind of started, Mm -hmm. when he kind of took off. Yeah. So going back to the jailery letter, his manifesto. Mm -hmm. It was essentially, as I said, Ned Kelly's manifesto. 
-hmm. It was 56 pages. Hell yeah. And below are a handful of excerpts written by Joe, as told by Ned. Oh, Joe. Quote, But it is not the place of the police to convict guilty men. As it is by them, they get their living. Had the right parties been convicted, it would have been a bad job for the police, as Barry would have sacked a great many of them. Only I came to their aid and kept them in their billets, in good employment, and got them double pay. And yet the ungrateful articles my mother and an infant, my brother-in-law and another man who was innocent, and still annoy my brothers and sisters and the ignorant unicorns, even threaten to shoot myself. But as soon as I am dead, they will be heels up in the maru. There will be no more police required. They will be sacked and supplanted by soldiers on low pay in the towns and special constables made of some of the farmers to make up for this double pay and expense. Mm -hmm. It will pay government to give those people who are suffering innocence, justice, and liberty. If not, I will be compelled to show some colonial stratagem which will open the eyes of not only the Victorian police and inhabitants, but also the whole British army. And no doubt they will acknowledge their hounds were barking at the wrong stump, and that Fitzpatrick will be the cause of greater slaughter to the Union Jack than St. Patrick was to the snakes and toads in Ireland. Damn. The Queen of England was as guilty as Baumgarten and Kennedy, Williamson and Skillian, of what they were convicted for, end quote. Mm -hmm. This is my last fun fact. Okay. Ned Kelly is listed in the top 100 of the world's most influential Irish and one of Australia's best-known historical figures. He was also the subject for the world's first feature film made in Australia in 1906, titled The Story of the Kelly Gang. Nice. And that is Edward Ned Kelly. I love it. He sounded really cool. He did. His whole gang was pretty cool. I mean, as as soon as I saw like the illustration of what his armor looked like, I just pictured him as the Black Knight from Monty Python. Like the whole <laughs> time I was researching him, how about you? Like I was just yeah. I feel like yeah. I think Heath Ledger played him. He did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that. And Orlando Bloom was Joe. Oh. Yeah, there have been a lot of movies and stuff Fitting. made about him. Yeah, there's been a lot of books, movies, plays, ballads. Yeah. Yeah, I, like w when you were saying that, I was like, I remember this because I watched that movie with Heath Ledger. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. On TikTok, of course you are. Follow us at Yield Crime Podcast. Hey everyone, this is Sophie Ray, owner and host of the Dead Strange Podcast. Join me every Friday as I talk about the world's most bizarre cases. From maddening unsolved mysteries to murders with an unusual twist. Be sure to subscribe to Dead Strange wherever you get your favourite podcasts and follow Dead Strange Pod across all social media platforms. Bye for now. This week's podcast plug is Dead Strange. Join Sophie Brown for a weekly show where she delves into the strangest cases from across the globe. They only have seven episodes, but they are mm -hmm. all so good that I still recommend you check it out. Nice. Just spread it out. Yeah. Once, once a week. What is something good you'd like to share? Um, something good. So this week, actually, I had a freelancing job that had taken me out of my house to do an event <laughs> and this is something I have not done I haven't worked an event or like worked outside of the home in a very long time like I quite literally cannot remember the last time I think it was like January that I've done an event 
and I saw some old familiar faces, which was really nice. And Willie was a king and was like so great with it and people were so respectful with him. And we were we were there for ten hours and he was like solidly wow. still working and being a good boy. And I'm I met a new friend and yeah, it was just a really like refreshing time. And then the next day mm-hmm. I got to see you and our family and your husband's family who I, I haven't seen mm-hmm. a lot of them in probably years at this point, like pre pandemic. Mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. it was just a nice little social weekend so I was really Mm -hmm. tired today (laughs) yeah like my social battery is very much empty and I need to recoup but it was really nice to kind of it was like riding a bike going into events like that so it was super great Mm -hmm. what about you what's one good thing I did my second 5k for the year yay I signed up for it I think the middle of the month and did it and I think I did okay for time it wasn't as good as the Twin Cities Marathon time but it was still pretty good and it was the first 5k for this it was the Mm -hmm. Sunrise Trail 5k and I think they're gonna do it again next year nice and they're gonna try and do it during our stagecoach days I think. Nice. So we'll get more people and yeah. I plan to do it again next year. Awesome. Yeah. Super cool. On that note, we're going to shut her down. Shut it down. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> get out. <laughs> get out of my house. <laughs> There's too many of you. You got to leave. <laughs> please, please leave. My battery. <laughs> My social battery. <laughs> my, my battery is now on fire. You need it. <laughs> it's burst into flames. <laughs> Just like those vagina candles from Gwyneth Paltrow. Burst into flames. <laughs> Just burst. <laughs> Just explodes. <laughs> Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. Anyway, on the topic of exploding vaginas... Mm -hmm. A great way to support the show, if you want to help out but can't do so financially, is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. This week's comes from our friend Tom over on Podchaser. He says, Lindsay and Madison will be your new besties. They'll call you and read the scripts for new episodes long before they're released. They'll send cases of wine. They'll buy you a new puppy. Just take a minute and listen to the show. You'll be glad you did. Also, the wine and the puppy and all that, I might not have accurately stated all of that. Just go listen. <laughs> Hurry. I was just going to say, wow, when did we send a puppy? That's interesting. <laughs> we are great. Wow. Pretty sure we great. would get arrested for sending a dog in the mail. <laughs> Pretty sure we can't do that. Or wine, you know. <laughs> It's just like the Ikea golden retriever in a five buck chuck. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) You're welcome. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad-free content, not to mention some bonus material, Become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. And you know what? Hmm. Yes. Chicken butt? I actually know when the next tea public sale is going to be. <gasps> Stop. Tell us everything. Mark this day down. <laughs> this is the first in a while that I have known in advance. 
<laughs> Mercury and microwave. Is it the largest full moon in the past 25 years? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> but you can get 35% off over at our Tea Public shop November Ooh. 2nd through the 5th. Get your shop on. And actually, mm-hmm. I'm going to give you another surprise. There are sales every week this month. So yeah, for if you miss this one, there's another one next week. And I'll tell you the dates for that one next time. Dang. So on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. <laughs>